This man is 36 years old. He has spent the last 20 of those years in and out of prison. Now he's out again, this time out of the U.S. Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta. This time he swears he won't be back. But he remembers how many times he's said that before, and he wonders. You wouldn't think a man who had spent more than half his life in prison could be called lucky. Yet that man is lucky. Lucky that prisons today aren't what they were when he first stepped a cell 20 years ago and the bars closed around him. The steel is still cold and hard. The calendar is still the most important thing in a man's life. And the wall still casts long shadows when the sun runs down the sky. It took 50,000 days of prison labor to build that wall and it took many thousands more days for the slow changes in prison treatment that give a man a better chance of making good once he gets outside that wall. The Atlanta pen opened, or as one convict put it, closed for business in 1902. Look how it is now, and listen to what it was like then. The guards now carry neither guns nor clubs. Then they carried clubs and struck any convict who spoke to another convict. The cafeteria now has 2,500 steady customers who talk freely among themselves. Then there was no talk. If a prisoner wanted bread, he held up his right hand. If he wanted soup, he held up a spoon. If water, his cup. If he so much as made a sign to another inmate, he might be handcuffed to a wall for several days. Not until 1916 could a prisoner buy candy. And when that happened, it was front page news for the Atlanta Journal. An inmate's family may visit him now two hours a month. Gone is the wire cage you see in the movies. Once there were no visitors, and the second warden said that if he had his way, every convict would be isolated from the world as if he were dead. He didn't have his way. Then the inmates wore stripes. Now they wear solid blue or white, all the same, no matter how important or unimportant they may have been. And there have been important men here. Gangster Al Capone, Broadway's Earl Carroll, big league baseball's Jim Rivera, presidential candidate Eugene Debs, who campaigned in 1920 from inside the prison and got a million socialist votes. At one time in the 1920s, there were in Atlanta Penn 25 bankers, 22 lawyers, 16 preachers, 43 policemen and one ex-warden of the Atlanta Federal Pen. Right now, a Paris leader of the French forces of resistance in World War II runs an elevator here. How? Why does a man send himself to prison? Let's look for one answer in the editorial offices of the prison magazine, headquarters of writers, artists, poets. The editor was selling cars in Mississippi in 1949, making good money. Yet he tried a hold-up, failed because he was an amateur. Then to make his getaway, he forced a cab driver at gunpoint to drive him across a state line. Today, a Saturday, he can play. During the week, he can work. A visitor may look and say, these guys have got it soft. And then he meets a man whose world for 11 years has been bounded by a wall that ranges in height from 28 to 37 feet, is two feet thick at the top and four feet thick at the bottom. If a man inside that wall is worried and wants to walk it off, someone's liable to ask him where he's going. If he has a headache at night, he waits until 11.30 the next morning, then gets in line and waits for a pill. If he wants to be alone, he has seven cellmates and 2,600 fellow prisoners in a place built for half that number. 2,600 men, no women. If he wants to see his wife and children, he can talk to them for two hours a month. Two hours a month. That's how a man is punished. A poet, who was never in prison, wrote, the bird of time has but a little way to flutter and the bird is on the wing. For a prisoner, the bird of time is a vulture, wheeling and soaring seemingly in the same spot over the dead, wasted hours.
still the man can smile at his plight. The Feds are one of the few baseball teams who play only home games. When a foul ball goes over the wall, the inmates groan with envy. Once the Feds had a big pitcher who took lengthy vacations between each pitch. Hecklers in the stands tried to speed him up, but the Feds catcher, a peppery Negro, shouted, Take your time, friend of mine. You got 10 years. Vocational counselor Perry Westbrook knows of a man who wasn't stopped by a prison record or another handicap. Perry, give me an example of a man who has taken your vocational training. We had a young fellow who came in here for a car there who was physically handicapped. And after a period of counseling and a series of tests, he chose radio and television repair. After two years in our training program, he was released found a job as a television repairman at about $85 a week. Then after a few months, he went into business for himself, and now has a business grossing between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 a year. And he hires four or five mechanics, and he prefers men who either have had a prison record or are physically handicapped. When he went to rent a place of business to move into, he told his landlord, I want to be perfectly honest with you, I have a prison record. The landlord said, I don't think that'll interfere too much, because I have a prison record, too. TV repair is only one phase of vocational training. Counselors test each new arrival. If he's been in trouble because he didn't know a trade, they help him select one. He might be taught to be a carpenter, an upholsterer, an architect, a printer, a machinist, a textile worker, a welder, a cook, a baker, a dental technician, a commercial artist, an artist who paints with oils, a horticulturist, or even a worm farmer. His crop is 100 million worms, and if he could sell them, which he can't, they'd be worth perhaps $25,000. The worms are busy making compost, a mixture perhaps three to six times more fertile than the richest soil. Example, big tomatoes grown in rich soil. Bigger tomatoes are grown above a patch of worms. The worm farmer gets out next year. He's found that crime does not pay, but worms do. The prison turns out 24 accomplished bricklayers each year. Instructor John Chick says one man came to him with a speech difficulty that indirectly may have turned the man toward crime. Once the prisoner had mastered bricklaying, he found new confidence, overcame the speech defect, and got a job outside making $3.65 an hour. Most of the inmates at Atlanta Federal Pen want to better themselves. They have a chance to go to school, and plenty of them take the chance. Psychologists recognize that a physical handicap may twist a man's personality so much that he becomes a criminal. If the handicap can be removed, the man is less likely to renew his lease on a cell. Dr. Carl Perko, chief medical officer at the prison, has something to say about that. Most people feel that they can pick out a criminal just from the way he looks. Anyone who visits a Atlanta federal penitentiary would find that not to be the case. Yet looks do play a part in a man's criminal tendencies. What do you do about that here, doctor? We use uh, plastic surgery. We attempt to improve a man's appearance so that it'll give him more pride and self-respect when he goes out. I can give you an example of a case who came with a double hair lip, uh, whose teeth uh, protruded through these uh, uh, this hair lip defect. Uh, he was so um, gave such a poor appearance that the uh, other inmates refused to eat at the same table with him. So we uh, removed his teeth, fixed him a uh, partial plate, uh, repaired his hair lip. The man grew a mustache, and you could hardly tell that he ever had a hair lip before. He was very proud of himself. And that has been several years ago, and he's gone out and hasn't come back. 
Some prisoners need more work on the inside than the outside. Another doctor, Chaplain H. Park Tucker, is one who takes over then. Chaplain Tucker's own dramatic career was reviewed for 50 million people on the network television show, This Is Your Life. Now he's written a book, Prison Is My Parish. Different men choose different ways of getting out. Some try escape. The wall began to rise in 1903, and for 20 years, not a man was able to go over the top. Then at this spot, one March morning, the notorious Gerald Chapman, using rope and a hook, cleared it and was gone. At some other prison, at some other time, the great truck robber had a date with an electric chair. He kept it. Three years ago, two inmates pried open a manhole cover and crawled a thousand feet through a drain pipe that went under the wall and emptied into a woods back of the prison. Two days later, two more prisoners went down the drain and out. That low road to freedom has now been blocked, and the four members of the Drain Pipe Brigade have been redrafted for longer hitches. In this prison's 55-year history, several have escaped, few for long, and none for good. Another way out, serve out the time to the end of endless days. Each man leaves with a new outfit, a train ticket, and up to $30. Warden Fred Wilkinson knows the parole story. The men know him as an intelligent, rugged, square shooter. He is the mayor of this town, but he answers to the director of all federal prisons, James Bennett. The warden was a Marine lieutenant in World War II, landed on Iwo Jima. A grenade blew away part of his left cheek, and three Jap machine gun slugs shortened his left arm. That ended his amateur boxing, but the man still slugs a tennis ball and runs a prison so well that last year he was named one of the top 10 civil servants among two and a half million government workers. Warden, how much of a man's sentence must he serve before he's eligible for parole? One third of his sentence. Is there anyone not eligible for parole? Well, recently, in particular last year, the Congress passed what they call the Narcotic Act of 1956, which means a man convicted twice of the felony of narcotics handling under certain uh, statutes um, may not be also for parole. Otherwise, any person serving one-third of his sentence does have the eligibility. It does not mean he will be granted parole, of course. What about a man who is serving a life sentence? Fifteen years. He is eligible. Have there been any notable failures in the parole system? Well, of course, there are a lot of heartbreaks in the business, and you're going to have some. We had a lot of satisfactions with it, too, but uh, one failure I might mention was a fellow we had on our honor farm out here who worked at the Pigry. He was released here in Atlanta, and he recruited some laborers, and they came out there in the dark of night. He knew the setup out there at the Pigry, and stole about $300 worth of our pigs. He hauled them off and uh, sold them down to the stockyard. Well, he was sent back then, of course, for stealing government property. And for some time, and up to this time even, when he goes in the dining room, they grunt at him. <laughs> so quite a case. That, that's a dramatic case of failure, I'd say. Truly. Okay. Let's talk about the brighter side. What is the percentage of success in the parolees? How many As of them don't come back? Dealing strictly with those who are paroled, there are several types of release. Now, on parole or conditional release, but parolees, I would say we have a Pretty good percentage, about 80 to 85 on those actually released by method of parole now. Not In other by words, four release. out of five men who go out on parole do not come back. What's your philosophy of running a prison warden? I would say that above everything else, I feel a man has been punished by being sent here. And our job, our major job, is to prepare him for the outside because we know he's going back into your community or mine we want him to be able to take his place on the competitive line from the standpoint of work, but above everything else, to be able to fit into the community. So I try to get a man to identify with good, wholesome groups of people so he can do it when he gets outside. Others are waiting and suffering justly, for at some time in their lives they have killed, stolen, cheated. But no matter how black his deed, every single man here has at least a speck of white goodness in him. The Prison Welfare Club has given $25,000 to the poor and sick. They paid for an Atlanta girl's high school education. She still doesn't know that criminals were her guardian angels. 
the Catholic prisoners built for themselves a place to worship a forgiving God. The paintings, everything is the handiwork of sinners. The prisoners have allowed themselves to be bitten so that malaria fever bakes their bodies. Their sacrifices help develop a new vaccine that guarantees immunity from malaria. They drink lysergic acid and suffer the tortures of schizophrenia to help science understand and cure the mentally ill. Why do they do these things? To ease their feeling of guilt, you say? perhaps, but it might also be that a convict who lives in a house of steel and stone is still a man and cares about what happens to his fellow man. Do you care what happens to him? Maybe he'll be getting out tomorrow. He'll be looking for the road back. Will you help him find it? Look down, look down, that long 